Thanks very much indeed, Pam, and to the Society for the invitation and to all of you for coming. I'm going to stay sitting down only because there's some high-tech filming going on. Um, and if I stand up, I'll disrupt everything. Um, so as Pam said, I'm going to talk about some of the myths that are perpetrated about social mobility in Britain's recent past, by primarily by politicians, to some extent by the press, and to a le lesser extent by some scholars. Um, and really the point that I'm going to try and emphasise today is that the social mobility myth is a very powerful one that we need to take very seriously, not because it reflects people's experience or the way that they talk about um, or act in their lives, um, but rather because it's a myth which has been used to legitimate maintaining a social hierarchy and a social elite in Britain as it became a democratic society across the 20th century. The project that I'm beginning comes up to the present, begins in about 1900, but today I'm going to talk mainly about Britain's 20th century rather than the early 21st when there are some very interesting changes that we can talk about in the discussion if people want to. Um, social mobility has generally been approached through uh, statistics, and I thought I would put up a graph to impress everybody, um, but I'm actually not going to be relying on statistical analysis very much. The general picture uh, that quantitative sociologists have uh, managed to give us is as follows, that there's a fair degree of social mobility across the 20th century, but that the period between the end of the Second World War and the 1970s really stands out as unusual in one way, in that it's the only period really when people experience upward mobility rather more than they experience downward mobility. Um, and that is something that I really want us to keep in our heads over the next 50 minutes or so, because in doing so, what these sociologists have done is to bust the central myth behind the political discourse around social mobility, which is that it's all about upward mobility, and that at a certain point in the past, upward mobility happened and can happen again for the majority of people. That's never been the case, um, and I hope to prove that it never will be. Upward mobility has always been a minority experience, and it's particularly important to emphasise, and you don't see this on the graphs, but the sociologists behind these graphs have proved this too, that the Cinderella story, a move from rags to riches, just is not reflective of the experience even of most of those people, uh, most of that minority who experience upward mobility over the last century. <coughs> what we see more of is what sociologists call short-range social mobility, particularly from uh, the manual working class into clerical work or from clerical workers into intermediate or lower managerial posts. Now, these statistics do embody some of the myths that I'm seeking to challenge. Um, one is that women's mobility can be traced by uh, uh, tracking their mobility compared to their father's occupations. We know enough now about the labour force participation of men and women uh, to work out that they have very different employment trajectories and that, that that's just too crude a measure. Um, another myth that I really want to interrogate in this project is one which is implicit in much of the data that we have on social mobility, which is that there's somehow an objective hierarchy of social mobility, which relies primarily or even exclusively on occupational rank. Um, it's very true and definitely comes across in the research that I'm doing that occupation is a primary uh, method by which people attain social mobility. But we all need to do rather more at questioning who it is who comes up with this occupational hierarchy, who determines that some occupations become professions, that some occupations are valued more than others. In this lecture, I'm going to refer to that hierarchy almost unproblematically and talk about people moving up and down. I want to make clear, though, that I see that hierarchy as a construct, constructed out of class relationships um, and largely by a social elite who have sought to hold on to and reproduce their power across the 20th century. Um, but most significantly for my purposes today, what these statistics don't tell us anything about is the experience of mobility. How does it feel to move up the social ladder? And I am going to deal with that group who move up the social ladder most today, precisely because they're so important to this pervasive myth about mobility.
Um, and I'm able to draw there on some really fantastic but very much overlooked work by feminist scholars that's taken place over the last 20 years and has been largely ignored by the mainstream of sociologists and historians. I'm talking here about feminist sociologists like Diane Ray and Steph Lawler and feminist historians like Carol Diehouse whose work has done so much to illuminate the very ambivalent experiences of people who've experienced both upward and downward social mobility, and which really needs greater consideration by all of us, whether we're working on women or on men. And I'm borrowing largely from their methodology in the kinds of sources that I'm using for this project. Just to give you a sense of those sources, um, I'm drawing on the uh, uh, records of many of the institutions that began to institute meritocratic entry practices um, in the early 20th century, both schools um, and uh, uh, sectors of the civil service. Um, banks are great because they also keep very detailed staff records. Um, but one of the uh, sources that I wanted to say some more about is mass observation. Um, in my work, I tend to make a great deal of use of personal testimonies, both published and unpublished, and that's true of this project as well. Um, but one of the sources that is really useful um, for historians, particularly of the last two-thirds of the 20th century, and particularly for a, a study on social mobility, is mass observation. Those of you who know anything about mass observation may know that it was revived um, as a project in the 1980s, um, that it's a self-selected volunteer group of people who agree to write on so-called directives that they're sent three or four times a year. Um, the prize is about 800 volunteers at the moment. Um, about 60% of them are women. The vast majority are white British, but they come from a range of social classes and they're born across a range of generations. So the oldest mass observers currently writing were born in the mid 1920s. The youngest were born in the very late 1980s. And uh, last year, we were able to uh, put together a directive um, which asked these questions um, of the mass observers, trying really to get, that, to get a sense of whether social mobility as a narrative made sense in how they thought about their lives. Um, the answer is that in many ways it didn't, but I'm gonna be drawing um, on their data uh, over this talk, and uh, that's why um, to some extent, this talk isn't going to deal very much with the immigrant experience or the black British experience, but I'm really happy to take questions on both because it's an area that I'm very interested in and I'm beginning to work on. And indeed, other scholars have done some great work in that period. So turning to the first myth, um, this is that social mobility is the kind of individual project um, of the self-made man. Now, this uh, is represented very strongly in political discourse and indeed in the press throughout the 20th century, but it, it comes out far less frequently in personal testimonies across the century. It's certainly true that becoming self-employed was something <coughs> that was very attractive to a whole range of manual workers and clerks right across the 20th century. The reasons that they gave for wanting to start a small business such as a shop were not, however, to do with accruing social status, but rather to gaining more control and autonomy over their lives rather than having to rely on an employer. And again, that's something which is going to come up again and again, that this idea that we all are or should be aspiring to social mobility or that those who have experienced social mobility are very, very status conscious, which comes up again and again, I think, in, in political rhetoric and indeed in much of the kind of literature about social climbing and the lower middle class um, in the early 20th century in particular, just isn't there. We need to be very careful that when we're measuring or looking for social mobility, we don't necessarily put motivations into people's mouths. It was a particularly attractive strategy too, particularly in the second half of the 20th century, for some immigrants to this country, partly to circumvent racial discrimination in the wider labour market and partly to compensate for a lack of English educational qualifications, which became increasingly important in gaining entry to certain jobs or gaining promotion from the 1970s onwards. But, and I think this is really important, for those who do achieve this form of self-employment, it's often seen as both insecure and temporary, a one or two generation strategy, not a permanent solution, not something that's seen as being something which will accrue property and wealth over time. 
Indeed, the children of the self-employed have often been given particular impetus by their parents to try and get into either the professions or into managerial positions in larger firms. And work by Mike Savage and other sociologists shown that they've often had great success in doing so. Another group who are often seen as self-made men in particular are clerks often conceived or satirised as social climbers who want to divorce themselves from their family of origin and join the middle class through using a great number of status symbols. This, they're particularly, of course, an object of ridicule in early 20th century literature, but that notion of the clerk as a kind of uh, anxious social climber remains well into the 1940s and indeed to some extent beyond. Now, what's interesting if we look at clerks is that what we find is that those among them who were consciously seeking to enter a different occupation than their parents often experience this not as trying to divorce themselves from their family of origin, but rather as part of a family project of improvement. Just to use one example here from the bank records that I mentioned, James Gray, a shepherd's son, unusually managed to become a bank clerk in the Bank of Scotland in the early 20th century. The Bank of Scotland, like a number of banks, wanted to expand its recruitment um, in the 1890s. The bank was expanding. It needed to get entrance outs from outside the usual middle class families um, that it targeted. And so an entrance examination and an interview were introduced. Very few working class young men, this kind of entry was limited to men, very few working class young men managed to enter banks at this point. Um, but most of the tiny number who did were, like James Gray, the second son. And that's very important. James Gray's older brother followed their father's mm. trade. He followed his father into shepherding. His wages helped to keep James in education until the age of 16, which then allowed him to take the bank's exam and to live on a poorly paid apprenticeship for the next five years, by which time he was also helped by his younger sister. He was one of a family of three siblings. She became a domestic servant. Now, his family were using tried and tested strategies that we know from economic and social historians had been used for at least decades by working class families to make ends meet and help children have a bit of financial <coughs> security. Pooling income, um, the use of siblings, of older siblings' income to help younger ones, and also the use of patronage of an employer, because both of James's parents were farm servants. Um, on a landed estate, and it was the landowner who spoke for James to the bank. James had to move away from home um, once he'd been trained by the bank to go and work at a branch elsewhere. Social mobility in the 20th century often means geographic mobility too. But he remained in very close contact with his family of origin. He was, after 40 years' employment um, and a happy marriage, eventually buried next to his brother and sister in the cemetery close to his parental home. So being upwardly mobile did not mean severing contacts with the rest of your family. And getting an education and a white collar job was just one of several strategies by which children could seek to have financially secure, more independent lives than their parents had had. Getting up the ladder to accrue social status wasn't always the prevailing concern. And I think James's situation is also a reminder that many of those who are, find themselves as clerks, or junior civil servants in the 20th century, don't necessarily see themselves as leaving the working class completely. Their extended family um, actually keeps them hooked into the working class, and I think means that we should complicate our understandings of the middle class a bit more than we currently do. Um, after all, one of the groups who unionised most rapidly in the interwar period were clerks. Now, in most cases, as I've tried to suggest, we don't really see an individual or even a family plan to achieve more social status, upward social mobility. But those few children who did seem to have a plan for moving up in the world tended to believe themselves not moving away from their family of origin as much as restoring their family's rightful status. Frequently, these are young men who were repositories for mother's stories of downward mobility in a previous generation. So to understand not only male mobility, but also women's full party mobility, we need to look at family relationships. One prominent example of this comes with C.P. Snow, who comes to fame as a scientist, a writer, and a Labour peer. 
C.P. Snow's father, for what it's worth, undertook a range of occupations from jobbing musician to a music tutor to, um, very briefly, manager of a very small shoe factory before he went bankrupt. But in fact, it's his mother who tells us rather more about where he ended up in his life. Um, Snow's mother taught, taught him to unquestioningly aspire to the life of her employers. She'd been in domestic service before she was married. She believed too that her own family, like her own employers, had once been landowners. And in his autobiographical novels, Snow talks about the intensity of their conversations, her desire that he take on and win the life that she believed herself entitled to, but could not, in an era of very limited female employment opportunities, hope to get for herself except by proxy through her son, her second son, because like James Gray, C.P. Snow was the second son of this family. Many of the mass observers also had received tales of downward mobility in their maternal families. These stories, whether they're true or not, I think are very significant because what they did was to offer a sense of entitlement to a better life. They're a reminder, I think, that in Britain, higher social status has often been reliant on heredity. And even in a century where democracy expanded and in which political rhetoric increasingly emphasised meritocracy, the importance of heredity as a justification for your status in life has persisted. This brings me on to the next myth, which is that selective education has increasingly enabled social mobility. This conclusion, peddled by right-wing politicians, tends to be based on the increase in upward social mobility in the years after 1945. And they're absolutely right. All of the data that we've got do suggest that the cohorts born uh, from the 1940s through to the 1960s experience greater rates of upward social mobility than ever before or since, and that that's true for women as well as for men. The cause of this is often put down to the 1944 Education Act, which enabled pupils to gain entry to academic grammar schools purely on their performance in the 11 plus examination. The problem is that only a minority, a tiny minority of working class kids made it through the exam. Most of them were part of that 80% who were written off as failures and attended secondary modern schools um, during this period. The reasons for this um, were often put down to parental aspiration and to some extent still are today. But in fact, successive social surveys were undertaken between the late 1940s and the early 1970s, which demonstrated that parental aspiration was extremely high in working class as well as middle class families. There was absolutely no difference that could be, ma that could be made in that regard. Um, and also that working class families were quite prepared to make the kind of sacrifices that middle class families made in terms of giving children where they could time and space to do homework, for example, buying educational toys and books. So it was definitely not the case that there was a kind of willfulness on the part of the working class to evade the grammar school. Why then is it the case that only a minority of working class children made it through to the grammar school is one question which is not really being answered by the politicians. But also, we do need to answer the question that they would put back to me, which is, well, why is it that the minority who did experienced great social mobility, and isn't that better than no upward mobility at all? My answer is that the increase that we see in upward social mobility from the working class in the post-war period is not about grammar schools, it's about a changing labour market. There was an increase in the number of people entering the professions in the post-war period. And this was due to the growth of the National Health Service and to secondary education, and more broadly, to the expansion of the infrastructure within the welfare state. Nurses, technicians, and teachers were the professions that saw the greatest rise in working class entrance. What's important about that is that it means that in the second half of the 20th century, a very large proportion of professionals within Britain um, are public sector workers, which isn't the same in all European countries um, and has some implications for the way that conservative cuts to the welfare state from the 1980s onwards um, uh, attracted such virulent opposition from different socioeconomic groups. So it's the case that we see some new professions coming out of the welfare state and some older ones expanding. But it's also important to realise 
that the most lucrative and high status professions, medicine and dentistry and the law, for example, remain dominated by the children of professionals from the middle and the upper middle classes, often privately educated. We see this happen time and time again in the 20th century, although most evidently in the post-war state. Upward mobility is explained by new professions opening up, new opportunities, rather than the older ones opening their doors. It's true that the grammar schools did act as a conduit towards these new and expanding professions. However, they didn't create these new jobs, nor did they have any success in channeling working class students into universities or into those so-called higher professions that I mentioned. And nor did they particularly want to. The testimonies of the few working class children who made it to grammar schools demonstrate a great deal of frustration about how limited these schools' aspirations often were for them. Working class entrants were most likely to leave at 15 or 16. Those who stayed on were most likely to be channeled into teacher training, often against their will. There was no sense of trying to raise most children's aspirations, even among that tiny minority who were given this supposedly golden ticket. Post-compulsory educational participation only increases, as Eve Worth demonstrated in her terrific paper this morning, when we see an expansion of further and higher education with the polytechnics and further education colleges from the late 1960s onwards, and when we have comprehensive education, which, as A.H. Halsey pointed out, broke down the predictability of pathways for 11-year-olds, as the grammar schools never had. This brings me on to the third myth, which is that a lack of aspiration or so-called cultural capital <coughs> prevents working class people from rising up the social ladder. I said before that many politicians have argued that relatively few working class people found their way into these socially elite schools or into the most socially elite professions because of a lack of social or cultural capital aspiration, not knowing how to do things the right way. <coughs> But I'd argue that the limited upward mobility that we see is not explained by wor what working class children and parents lacked during the 20th century, as much as by the behaviour of the <laughs> members of elite institutions. In the post-war decades, successive governments and a generation of sociologists, many of whom themselves had experienced a degree of upward social mobility, became very intrigued into why professions like medicine, dentistry and the senior civil service um, were not particularly expanding to admit more entrants from working class backgrounds. They undertook surveys, often very extensive surveys, funded in the 1960s by Harold Wilson's Labour government. And what these studies revealed was that preference was given by the gatekeepers in these professions to certain groups of applicants who looked most like the, incu the incumbents of these occupations. In medicine, it was very often the case that entrants were following in their father's footsteps. The most prestigious medical schools were very open as late as the 1970s about the fact that they gave preference and in some cases had a quota of places for the children of doctors. In the civil service, preference was given, often overtly, to Oxbridge graduates. So gatekeeping worked in favour of the children of the middle and upper middle class and against those of other groups. This was particularly likely to occur in occupations where entry or promotion was determined by nebulous or highly subjective criteria. Character in the first half of the 20th century, often used by banks, or in the second half by intelligence, which by the 1960s biologists and sociologists had admitted could not be measured by the 11 plus or indeed by any other kind of exam. That, incidentally, was a conclusion reached by the civil service in 1948 when it was suggested that they introduced a form of the 11 plus um, to widen their uh, uh, entry to new intakes. And after extensive use of this, the civil service concluded that it was absolutely useless and assessed nothing. Recent work by sociologists and anthropologists supports these older investigations in emphasising that a lack of robust and transparent selection criteria tended in the, in the last quarter of the 20th century to lead employers, university admissions tutors and selective schools to select entrants who looked and sounded like those already in the institutions. <coughs> 
this isn't simply a story of what we're now expected to call unconscious bias, although I doubt much of it was that unconscious. Too often in recent years, I think scholars have assumed, as politicians do, that class hatred works one way, envy by those at the bottom for those at the top. Now, I'm going to talk here a little bit more about education, and I want to make clear that I see education as only one criterion in shaping social mobility. Labour market opportunities are very important. Family background is also extremely important. But what's really valuable about examining education is what it reveals about middle and upper middle class practices and upper class practices, which ensure that family background remains so important. Parents tend to be unusually explicit about the strategies they've adopted to ensure their children win educational privilege, far more so than they are about their own practices as employers, managers, teachers in private schools, for example. Perhaps partly because in the case of their children, they're acting on behalf of allegedly vulnerable others, not apparently for themselves. So I think we can learn quite a lot about their practices in education um, sorry, I think we can learn quite a lot from their practices in education about how they operate in these other spheres as gatekeepers. What's clear from my data, and particularly from the mass observers, is that many parents understood a truth that politicians who peddle social mobility as a panacea for society's ills often gloss over, that mobility means some people have to go down if others are going up. There are only a very limited number of places at the top, or even in the so-called intermediate white-collar occupations in the capitalist society that Britain is and was throughout the last century. Letting more working-class children access some of these means that some of the upper or middle-class children are going to have to fall down the social ladder. This is something which has caused great anxiety and anger um, to many of the middle class um, across the 20th century. It's not the case uh, that all of them were seeking to hang on to opportunities just for themselves or their children. And I want to make very clear that um, when I'm talking about those who do, I'm talking about a fragment of the, of the middle class. We see many middle class people, including many of those who are upwardly mobile and uh, maybe only mean middle class for a generation, seeking to broaden opportunities for all across the 20th century. Um, we've heard a fantastic paper to only today from Michelle Johansson about public librarians of the early 20th century. We need to think about teachers and social workers in the post-war welfare state as fulfilling a similar role, seeking to broaden opportunities for many people and not simply reproduce their privileges for their own children and a few others. But it is the case that there's a section of the middle class, and my data would suggest it's often the section who have been middle class for two generations or more, who do seek to hang on to privilege and see education as one means of doing so. Looking at the mass observers, um, we see virulent opposition to expansion of educational opportunity expressed right across the century. Now, before the 1980s, the kind of middle class justification for having, for example, um, a monopoly on grammar school places. There was a lot of opposition to the 1944 Education Act making grammar schools free, for example. That kind of, um, ex that kind of argument tends to rely um, on a justification that suggests that family background, tradition and parental support will enable their children to make much better use of an academic education and a professional career than their working class counterparts. I'm not talking enough today about the way that the state and employers um, collude in this and indeed facilitate it, but just to point out that they are absolutely colluding and facilitating. In the Treasury reforms of education in the early 1930s, we see the Treasury demand that local education authorities um, give greater access to um, their scholarships to secondary schools to the middle class. Um, by getting rid of full scholarships and introducing uh, partial subsidy, su subsidised school places, which middle class parents could afford to take up for their kids, but working class um, children could very rarely um, afford to take. We see in debates around the iniquities of the 11 plus um, a similar kind of sympathy for this middle class moves at national level to start to get rid of the 11 plus really gain momentum from the late 1950s when the kind of baby bulge of the late 1940s begins to reach 11. There aren't enough grammar school places for them. 
and middle class parents begin to shift their opinion towards the 11 plus um, and decide that they're hostile to it. There's often a kind of narrative that it takes middle class parents' activism um, to actually do anything about the 11 plus, but that's not true. There's a lot of opposition to the 11 plus before the late 1950s being expressed by working class parents. It's expressed in local education authority reports to national government, but no notice is taken of it. It's when it starts to affect the middle class that they start to listen. And more recently, we see it with what's been happening with academies, um, where we're told that comprehensives are doing very badly, but in fact, what academisation has enabled is private schools to turn themselves into academies, gain state subsidies, and allow middle-class parents who were um, struggling to maintain their children in private education after the financial crash um, to continue to send them to what remain socially elite schools. I said that before the 1980s, there's this kind of um, very open acknowledgement of the idea that family background um, uh, traditions and support enable middle class children to just make better use of opportunities. Since the 1980s, that's changed. Middle class parents begin to use a more neoliberal discourse uh, that reifies the individual or certain individuals. They suggest, for example, that their children are particularly sensitive, usually daughters, or gifted, usually sons, who are disruptive unless they're stretched sufficiently at school, and that their children therefore require special educational treatment in order not to be destroyed by working class peers who will encourage sons to be more disruptive or will cow sensitive daughters. Where this links to the, to the first part of the century, though, is that throughout the century, what we see is a determination to ensure that children retain their parents' privilege, but that this is also coupled with a casting of the working class as undeserving of education and professional status. Schools and employers collude in this in a number of ways I've tried to indicate, but it's probably also worth saying that as part of this project, I'm tracking the scholarship awards that are made by numerous private schools, um, including some of the big girls' high schools and boys' grammar schools across the 20th century. And those scholarships go, in the vast majority of cases, to middle-class children, often from families who claim to have fallen on hard times, um, but whose income is actually more than the average manual worker is earning at that particular point. So all this just reiterates, I think, that when upward mobility does increase, it tends to occur in periods when, school, when, sc when, when educational opportunity expands, such as with comprehensive education, or when new professions open up. So rather than middle or upper class children falling down the ladder, more room has to be opened up to allow working class children to get on. What I've also tried to emphasise here is that elite institutions are elite because they are socially elite. And the kind of argument that somehow schools or professions could be made which are elite based on intelligence or cultural capital or social capital is an absolute nonsense. Pierre Bourdieu, who came up with the concepts of social and cultural capital, was quite clear that they are absolutely umbilically linked to the middle class, that there is no objective intelligence or objective best form of education. What we're seeing here is a very... Um, uh, a very embedded form of cultural and social reproduction um, which manages to align social elitism with um, excellence um, and which I think needs to be challenged. This brings me to the fourth um, myth which is that getting up the ladder means imitating those a few rungs up. Even if we were to buy the argument about working class people lacking social and cultural capital, the kind of logical conclusion of that is that those who get on must accrue it and start behaving like their middle or upper class counterparts. But that's not the case if we look at the few who did manage to climb the social ladder in the 20th century. Working class entrants to elite spaces, whether professions or schools, were often expected to behave quite differently from the incumbents. So working class entrants to private or the most selective grammar schools were expected to be both bright and hard working. And the same was true of bank clerks and civil servants. That's because their presence was due to their school or employer's alleged commitment to meritocracy. And so these entrants had to be brilliant to justify this. Otherwise, we might as well say, well, entry is a lottery, you know, and it's, it's kind of random who gets in, which is my belief. But they simultaneously had to be seen to work very, very hard to achieve their success. 
In Britain, there's a long-standing belief that true superiority is hereditary and that the strongest talents are innate, we're born with them. Middle and particularly upper class um, uh, uh, people might be praised for their effortless brilliance within their profession um, or their education. But working class entrants had to show themselves to be diligent and focused, to be deserving of their special, cla cl of their special chance. And they also had to show themselves grateful for that chance. In banks, working class entrants were, placed were praised for their deference, while their middle class counterparts were praised for confidence and leadership skills. Working class young men like James Gray, who I referred to earlier, had to distance themselves from stereotypes of their class as rough, dirty or loud. In the words of Billy Fisher, the protagonist of Keith Waterhouse's novel, published 50 years after James Gray started his career, Billy Liar, they had to be grateful, grateful, grateful. That's all I ever hear, grateful. Many of those in this situation found that role a strain to maintain, and long term, it wasn't one that helped them to get on in their careers. Social confidence, knowing the right people, in many professions, patronage is very important, either to establishing yourself or, in the case of those banks, for example, extending a client base. Um, and so-called talent, the appearance of effortless brilliance, have all tended to be prized in, for example, selection for Oxbridge places or for promotion to managerial posts in many occupations. As this suggests, a study of social mobility can't simply examine what kind of job a child enters compared to its father. Whether they can achieve promotion within their occupation is also important because of what Sam Friedman has called, um, in a phrase that owes much to feminist sociologists, a class ceiling in many professions. And that brings me to the next myth, which is that social mobility takes place before the age of 35. I've obviously focused mainly here on the experience of youth. Statistici statisticians concerned with social mobility tend to assume that people's role in life is pretty fixed by their <coughs> mid-30s. But we know that that's not true of women for whom childcare and divorce can have huge consequences and who have often, particularly over the last 40 years, returned to education um, after their mid-30s, after, after their childbearing years. This focus also means, I think, that we overlook some important waves of downward social mobility, which tends to be more of a feature of middle and later life, rather more than youth. These include men and women who have immigrated to Britain after the age of 35, many of whom experienced downward mobility on arriving here, and also the unemployed of the recessions of the 1930s and 1980s, in both of which, particularly in the 30s, men over 35 were very badly affected. What this reminds us is that downward mobility needs to be part of the story, and so too does the experience of older people, something that Pat Thane's history um, of old age reminded us a number of years ago, but which many of us still haven't taken on enough, I think. Um, it's interesting that when my wonderful researcher Jim Hinks was looking at pictures for this presentation, he could come up with very few of older women workers, and this one from B&Q, I think, says it all, that really <coughs> women in particular in later life should just be grateful for any paid work they get, which is quite worrying given that we know that one of the groups who are still most likely to live in poverty in Britain today are people who are claiming old age pensions. The final myth that I want to challenge is that social mobility is a social good. Let's assume for a moment that the politicians are right and that the mobility story that really matters is the one of upward mobility from the working class into the middle class, the one that I've focused on today. Even here, we find that the impact on individuals is variable, to say the least. For a long time, it was assumed that upward mobility was highly positive um, for those concerned. More recently, people have begun to question this. As Richard Hoggart wrote some 50 or 60 years ago now about the working class scholarship boy, many experienced climbing the ladder as isolation, feeling that they neither belo belonged in their family of origin or in the new place that they found themselves inhabiting. More recently, as, as Steph Lawler and Diane Ray have pointed out, others have experienced guilt that they have had opportunities denied to siblings or parents and in the case of women in particular have found the work involved in being um, a, a, a middle-class wife 
um, and mother who is expected to reproduce class privilege in the ways that I set out earlier, on top of often maintaining um, a career or an attempt at a career in a middle class job, is extremely exhausting. On the other hand, it would be inaccurate and disingenuous of me to suggest that working class people experience upward mobility as a culture shock. And it would also be, I think, to romanticise working class life, aspects of which many people have wished to escape from over the last century. And that desire for escape should be taken seriously. Among the mass observers, many relished going to grammar school, into elite universities and enjoyed a professional career. Contrary to the claims of Hoggart, many working class people did not live in, in hermetically sealed communities but were often members of socially diverse towns and cities who patronised cinemas, libraries and museums, encountering a far broader range of people than many of their more cosseted upper and, and middle class counterparts. They did not always experience a great culture shock on meeting others from different social backgrounds when they went to a socially elite school or left home to go to university. What was often a shock was the prejudice that they met there about their background, or often more frequently, simply an assumption that they wouldn't want to talk about their background, that it was of no interest and no relevance and couldn't explain how they'd got into the space that they were, that they were now occupying. In other words, that their experience just did not matter. And that idea that the working class have absolutely nothing to offer culturally or socially to their children, other than to simply remain in the kind of idealised working <coughs> class community um, that Hoggart depicted, is I think very pervasive and is something that women in particular talk about as being um, a real sense of loss, that there are very few spaces that they can talk about their past um, uh, if they are upwardly mobile. Having said that, women were also particularly likely to adapt relatively easily to some of these social elite spaces. <coughs> Men, and this is particularly true of the post-war generations, were far more likely to experience the loss of a regional accent or even donning a suit as ambivalent. They were always worried about not being true to themselves in some way. Women were far less likely to, to experience it like that. They were brought up to believe that working on their bodies and characters was a form of real work for which they should be compensated. And that doing that work did not necessarily mean that their inner self was being harmed or affected. Some of them took pride in being able to lose an accent at will and then readopt it when they went to visit their family of origin. But importantly, they were also tending to end up in, in spaces like teaching, where they mixed with a large number of, of other women who, regardless of social background, tended to experience sexism and discrimination in, in, large, in large parts of the workplace. And this shared experience could be very important in forging common bonds. Because of women's limited employment choices, many of them also ended up tending to end up in jobs where a large number of other entrants shared their social origins, like nursing and technical work after the Second World War. And indeed, the post-war generation, men as well as women, were less likely to experience upward mobility as isolating or unhappy if they ended up working in that expanded public sector. Ascribing their widespread upward mobility to political and economic changes after the war, which importantly most of them did and didn't tend to ascribe it to the grammar school, even if they'd attended one. Being able to ascribe their mobility to those kinds of generational changes that had been brought about by the state seemed to enable them to make sense of their good fortune and the reasons why their parents had not experienced this. That group among all of the mass observers, are distinct in talking less of an individual struggle to make it and more of a collective social uplift. In fact, it's been very often the case, particularly um, but not exclusively for the generations before, and before the post-war um, post period I've just talked about and those who came after, that the limited opportunities for social mobility tended to be more frustrating and dispiriting than the experience of mobility. James Gray, the shepherd's son at the Bank of Scotland, had a nervous breakdown in his 10th year of employment there, just at the stage where it became clear to him, I think, that his next promotion to senior clerk would in all likelihood be his last. He was never going to be made manager, at the same time that some of his middle class peers were being accelerated. The monotony of his work had begun to affect him. He increasingly made mistakes. His manner became, in his staff reports, brusque. Eventually, he became very ill. He recovered... But that breakdown at that particular kind of career point is a theme in men's careers that runs right through the 20th century. It affected many of the mass observers too. 
For women, that moment of crisis often came sooner, often at their entry to the labour market, after A-levels or after university. Their career options were few, but many of them tended to ascribe this at least as much to sexual discrimination um, as to class. In the 1980s, to some extent, that changes for both men and for women. We have a situation then where those public sector professionals who I've been talking so much about have children who are coming of age. They, um, some of them want to replicate what their parents have done. And many of the mass observers who were born in the 1960s, for example, talk with pride of, for example, my children are the third generation to be going into the NHS. They talk almost like that as a kind of, you know, a sort of um, a family tradition that they're beginning to be proud of. <coughs> but for the children born in the 1970s, it's completely different. By the time they come of age, the public sector has lost some of its worth as an employer. Redundancies are beginning to happen. The status of groups like teachers is being denigrated. Unionisation is being threatened. The world their parents knew is not the world that they would enter if they followed in their parents' footsteps. So a growing number of them men and women aspire to enter those older professions that I mentioned, academia to some extent, law, medicine and so on. They can't get there, very many of them, and for women in particular that's a source of great frustration and angst. I think that part of what's going on here is the arrival of a liberal feminist narrative that coalesces with neoliberalism to suggest that women could have it all, um, but at the same time that if they didn't get it all they only had themselves to blame. And just to give one example here, Annika, one of the mass observers who was born in the 1970s, her parents were public sector workers. Um, she decided that she wanted, as she said, to do better in life than they, than, than, than they had. She wanted a financial security, which by the late 1990s, following in their footsteps as social workers, simply wouldn't necessarily have got her. And she thought she saw a way to do this. She applied to socially elite universities, got into one, and set her sights on a law career. She did everything she was told. She worked hard and she looked the part as well. She worked very hard on her body and her accent to sound right and look right. But her failure at university to gain acceptance from her privately educated peers, her astute observation of the kind of career networks that were beginning to evolve and which she was never going to be given access to, and her failure to achieve the exam grades she believed she'd need for career success. I think she was ambivalent about that. I think she kind of knew that she was going to need more. She was going to need contact as well as exam grades, but she began to get her anxiety went into her exam grades because it was really the only thing that she could affect. All of that anxiety in the end fueled anorexia and depression, and she eventually dropped out of university. And this is recurrent, I think. 20 years later, Annika had established a career in local government that she found fulfilling. Public sector work still remained the most accessible way for working class children to gain social mobility. And it's still the case that the children of those public sector professionals like Annika herself do tend to enter those occupations. But she and many of her peers remained frustrated and ashamed at not achieving their goal. In a neoliberal society which suggested anyone could have anything they work for, she could only ascribe her failure to her laziness and a lack of talent. Just to finish, I just wanted to point to one group who are almost immune to feelings of shame or ambivalence over the 20th century about social mobility, socialists. And this brings me to my final point, which is that there have always been groups who have questioned the notion that social mobility was a social good and suggested that equality, not meritocracy, should be the goal of a democratic society. In the early 20th century, the Workers' Education Association and labour colleges like Ruskin in Oxford promoted the educational highway, arguing for broader educational opportunities for the vast majority of Britain's people, not simply the so-called brightest. A huge controversy in the labour movement between the 1900s and the 1930s was whether, in fact, activists should seek entry to establish institutions at all or seek to form their own. But whichever side of the debate they came down on, those involved were united by scepticism towards the rationing of opportunity. And decades before sociologists began to question the worth of terms like bright and whether we could really measure intelligence, these activists were contesting such words, arguing that they were just forms of social elitism dressed up to look respectable. <coughs> 
Throughout the first half of the 20th century, the cooperative movement, the trades unions and the Labour Party provided routes to education and professional employment for generations of working class men and women. And importantly, they're about the only institutions that actually managed to force the door ajar in some of those older professions, particularly in politics, where we see the first generations of Labour Party um, uh, members of parliament coming from all sorts of social backgrounds, but including the working class. It's notable how many of the f those first Labour MPs came through routes like the WEA and Ruskin, but it's perhaps even more significant that a very large number of teachers, shop managers, local government offices and adult education tutors owed their training and livelihoods to the Labour movement and went on with some of those Labour MPs to be um, agents and architects of the post-war welfare state. As Diane Ray, recently retired professor of education at Cambridge University and the daughter of a trade union activist, has written, the children of these socialists tended to feel a sense of entitlement to the good things in life. They didn't believe that they deserved an education or the job of their choice because they were particularly bright, gifted or sensitive, but because they thought everyone should have access to this. And this kept them going in the face of the slights and the prejudices that they met at some of the socially elite schools that they attended or the professions that they went into. Very few of them adopted the persona of grateful quietism that I outlined earlier. Some of them managed to have professional careers inside the labour movement and the post-war expanded public sector. Some became instrumental in campaigns to broaden educational access, like the Campaign for Comprehensive Education. Others challenged the social and, occupa and occupational hierarchy in various ways. They included, for example, the pioneers of law centres, which from the 1960s and 70s gave more people access to recourse to the law, but also provided different training and job routes for lawyers outside established networks of solicitors firms. And the WEA and the Open University, a creation of the Labour governments of the 1960s, are the organisations most frequently cited by mass observers as crucial in enabling them, their siblings or their parents to gain an education and a fulfilling career. These institutions were less concerned with ensuring that the right people won the top places than with questioning the legitimacy of a society divided by winners and losers. And importantly, they were non-selective. I've heard it argued that a history of social mobility shouldn't give much time to these voices. And after all, they were always a minority. And yet many politicians seem willing to give a great deal of space and consideration to that very small minority who experienced upward social mobility from the working class to the professions, the older professions, in the middle of the 20th century. And to suggest that somehow their gains, uneven and ambivalent as they often were, outweigh all the injustices perpetrated by a hierarchical capitalist society on the vast majority who have to live in it. The mass observers certainly didn't want to return to the past. We didn't ask them to imagine what society they wanted to live in, but notably most of them chose to offer some proposals. And what they, socially mobile or not, desired was free education up to and including postgraduate study, and that was particularly strongly felt by those of them who had never been to university. Local non-selective schools, a more socially diverse parliament, and legislation on pay and pension rights with an emphasis on fairness and security for all, not payment by results, not payment according to a person's talent, not even according to their qualifications in a society that selects those who are allowed to get qualifications. They would like us to place more, experience, more value on experience. We live in a society that's profoundly unequal and in which most people seem to believe we need huge social transformation to make it better for all of us. Those voices asking for equality may not have won in the past, but now we know how limited the gains of meritocracy truly are, we should at least acknowledge that they are worth listening to. Thank you.